Victor Naufel, how are you? Good, good. Thank you for coming to, uh, to our studios at the ION. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. The, I, I, this, this, this episode will be a great episode, and uh, you know, I have a lot of questions for you. Uh, uh, are you ready to dive in? Yeah, sure. Awesome. Uh, I'll start with a quote, as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, quote says, uh, The wheel of progress turns with the hands of innovation and the mind of wisdom. End of quote, Sargon of Akkad. Uh, very famous word in Iraq is shakumaku. Sure. A lot of people don't know what the origin of it. Uh, so, for before start, shakumaku, how, how was everything? Doing good, alhamdulillah. Awesome, awesome. How's the travels? You're traveling around? Yes, yes. Going back and forth between Houston and Baghdad and, and the region over there. I enjoy it. Awesome, great, great. So, so the origin of the word shakumaku, it's actually a Sumerian origins. And you can imagine about 2,300 years ago, this word was used and still used today. Uh, we, we talk about Iraq. We're talking about eight civilization. We're talking about uh, science, invention of the letter. Uh, I know Phoenicians will say the alphabet. That is correct. The letter was invented in Iraq. Uh, the wheel and Baghdad battery. There's so much history in the region, especially Baghdad. It is considered the, creator, the cradle of civilization. And the next uh, hour or so, we will be talking about uh, where, Iraq, where you come from, your journey, and then we'll tackle your career. So I'll start with uh, a question. Can you tell us about your life, family, and the environment where you grew up? Well, I born from a middle class family, um, originally from south west of Iraq, from a city called Samawa. I born in Baghdad, um, um, but I didn't discover Baghdad just lately, you know, um, because uh, my family had to move um, when I was about two or three years uh, to the south, to uh, an agriculture, small city called Ashatra. It's in uh, the Qar provinces. So, um, so all my memory on Baghdad, it comes later than the early childhood. My childhood um, memories uh, mainly in the south, uh, specifically in Shatra and then later in Samoa. Awesome. Okay, so, so you were born in Baghdad, but your family moved south. Yes. Uh, awesome, awesome. Now, uh, can you talk a, a, about uh, when you grew up, your education? So you started, uh, I'm guessing, uh, in Shatra, Samawa, as part of Samawa. You started your... No, no, Shatra, Shatra. different than Samawa. Yeah, Shatra in the south, yeah. Okay, so can you talk about your education? What, what, what are you a member of the south? Yeah, um, again, in, in that city, it's agriculture-based. Small city, but it's a rich with culture, with... Um, literatures, you can easily see many artists and uh, poets. And um, um, uh, it's a very nice agriculture area, but also um, I spend big time over there in the library closer to my house, uh, you know, with a lot of books. Um, in addition to that, we have in our house um, uh, decent uh, shelves books. And my dad had my dad, he, uh, he was a government employee. Um, um, he loves reading. So um, you can see in his uh, bookshelves um, books for Karl Marx, and you also see for Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr, and you can see Dial Carnegie, you can see Al-Jawahiri and Al-Mutanabbi, and also you can see Shakespeare, T.S. Eliot, so that variety of of, of uh, um, you know books um, um, in the early childhood um, brought me to um, to create my early uh, values and inspiration. There's the old saying that says. Uh, Cairo writes, Beirut prints, and Baghdad reads. Uh, I do, if I recall, you were born in the early 60s, right? Yes. And, you know, at that time, uh, Iraq is considered uh, a beacon, in, in, even in civilization and education. So I want to go back and talk about the library as um, 
the you, you said library was it a public library? Yeah, it's a bu- public library. It's behind our house. So, um, you know, I live in a neighbor's. Um, most of it government employees. So it's a little bit separated on the traditional city, but you can see on my left hand um, a very nice um, park, mm-hmm. kind of a small garden. You go there, you play, and you're right, you will see the a library. Lot. So um, again, I had a lot of memories, a lot of stories in the library. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. Shatra itself, um, again, it's a small city, but it has a lot of dynamics. Mm. Um, Many people resist the previous regimes. They expel to the south, to that city. So you can easily see the debate uh, between uh, Islamists, communists, uh, nationalists. And you can go to the cafes where people debate um, yeah, small um, um, bookstores where you, they um, they sell the the newspapers. Mm-hmm. I remember I was in the fifth or sixth grades where I start subscribing in the newspapers. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. So basically, the book was your friend. Yes. And, and and what started it is just the library around the corner, and and, and that library was it a government thing? Uh, who established the library? It is it is the govern it's a government initiative. Uh, yeah, it's a government. So it's a, um, again, you know, we are talking about small city um, where you don't have too much to do it, mm-hmm. but in that time in the late sixties, early seventies, where you can find. Um, thousands of titles you know yeah. that's 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 um, an opportunity i remember there was no internet there was no yeah. even the tv in that time we have uh, one black and white um, tv one channel and it's it's a very tough to you know uh, get the signal interesting now uh, in the 70s your family moved again to samawa yes in the middle of 70s yeah. middle of 70s yeah can you talk about moving from city to city uh, i know they're in the same area but there there is a character differences how did that moving shaped the way you think or influenced you if any well our move from baghdad the capital to shatra um um, I didn't notice it too much because it was, you know, in Younger. early. Yeah. yeah, but the other move to Samawa, uh, it was a turning point for me. Mm-hmm. When we talk about Samawa, again, it it's considered my my family city. Yeah, you know, my you know grandfathers, grandmothers, you know, all the rest of the family who immigrated to Baghdad, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, decades ago, but they always consider themselves, just like myself, al- always we consider ourselves as a Samawa, not from Samawa. Baghdad. So mm. in that city, that city, it's a kind of uh, um, ironic. Um, in the, um, the city is um, um, sitting on the Euphrates River. Yeah, the poets say Samawa uh, sleeps on the Euphrates, uh, and uh, yeah, and it, it it's a gateway to the desert. True. So from the left side, you can see. I mean, from the west side, it's it's a gate for the you know the largest desert in Iraq. Mm-hmm. You know the um, uh, Sahara al Gharbiya, and then it's a gate for you know neighboring to Saudi, uh, in, in the east side of the city you can easily see the farms you know the palms and uh, there's a famous song about Nakhla Samawa Belly. you know the palm of yeah. the city of Samawa and again in that city also a reflection of what happened in 1970s remember the world in that time you know the uh, Vietnam War just you know mm. ended and also in the region there was an October war. There is a in, in inside Iraq. There was a um, um, a lot of conflicts. You know, um, the Kurd in the north of Iraq. You know, rebel against the the regime, the central government. So there was a, always fight. Specifically, you know, uh, when the attempt for uh, reforming um, 
um, uh, consolation it's it failed so then the 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 war brought every day uh, a new coffins a new a new soldiers mm -hmm. killed in that time also the um the the uh, authoritarian regime start crystallizing their power what year we're talking about here i'm um, talking about the mid 1970s you 70s know. Well, al becker was the prime minister yeah al becker was the president in that time president. but remember saddam was the second, vice president second so second Allah. second but he's mm -hmm. you know r running the show yeah uh, one more thing you know in 1972 the government nationalized the oil 72 72 and then you know the implemented in march uh, 1973 so it's, a, it's another turning point. W was this influenced by Mossadegh experience of in, uh, nationalizing? That was, you know, Mossadegh was 53. 1950, yeah, 53. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's almost like a two decades gap. Okay. But, but again, the, the theme in that time for most of the um, military uh, cope in the region, mm -hmm. um, you know, try to get nationalism. Uh, nationalism. Yeah. The problem, it's not about nationalizing the oil. Uh, it's nationalizing the economy and also nationalizing education, nationalizing the journalists, nationalizing mm. the, you know, the liberal life in Iraq. Um, gradually, uh, I mean, Iraq in 1950s, before the oil become part of uh, Iraqi economy, mm. um, Iraq used to export to, you know, all the world, you know, their yeah. agriculture products, you know, their, their um, uh even here to the United States, you know, uh, Iraq used to export a lot of uh, products to UK, to Europe, to Japan. Uh, unfortunately, when the uh, military coup in 1958 and then the other, um, you know, administration and coups and military um, controlling the, 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 the social life, social and life, way. and, and then um, you can easily in the early 1970s, even the private school closed. Oh wow! Private universities closed. I mean, some of the Jesuit, you know, you know, mm. uh, Baghdad College or or or, or, or many other um, um, uh, good schools in, in Iraq, private schools, you know, religious schools, they start, you know, closing down or shutting down. All Why? These. It's, again, you know, we have a a party who believes. Uh, with a theme that they are the controller of the life of the people. Of the people. And again, they get the, the oil wealth and also they get the military. So what's the rest? The rest is the mm -hmm. soft um, uh, leverages that people has, you know, yes. liberal life, journalists, you know, education, all these gradually, even unions, become um uh, you know acting for the that party for the main party yeah the path party yeah. I, I do remember uh when i was an undergrad uh, i worked with a an organization that helped refugees settle in and and and, and the first time i met an ashurian iraqi mm -hmm. and he invited me to their house so his mom was there to his brother and his dad and they were talking in Ashurian, and I, 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 to, I told him I almost understand 20 to 30 percent because some of the words resonate with Arabic. And uh, when I asked him about the experience he lived, they talked about they were preventing them from learning the Ashurian language in school. They were forcing everybody to learn just Arabic. Arabic. Yeah. And now I, I do r correlate that with the, with the fact that even private schools who produced people like Zaha Hadid were, were closed down or uh, College of Arts uh, or, or uh, where a lot of famous artists were, including uh, a friend of mine who actually now lives in L.A., Qais uh, Sindi, we send our regards to him. He actually uh, drew a big, uh, still exists today in the 70s, I think, or 60s, uh, a big painting in the School of Art. Now, we do talk about the segment and, and, and the diversity of Baghdad then because a lot of people think only Islamists existed even in the South. It's, it's to me to, no. to say like there was even, more, you know, socialist oh. or, or and, and th there was a free debate. People like got along. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm talking about, you know, the society, you know, Iraqis love debates. 
You know, mm. that's that's not my words. You know, you know, even during the Khilafah, the Abbasis, or even before that, you know, during um, Imam Ali's, uh, you know, uh, time, and even before that. But um, unfortunately, um, Iraq is not lucky to get a, a fair and justice ruler or government. Um, so they paid a costly price during their history. Mm -hmm. And Iraq, blessed with um, you know, variety of resources. Unfortunately, most of these resources, you know, went here and there, but um, rarely focused on building Iraq and Iraqis. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to Samawa, um, again, I'm talking about uh, um, you know, remember Samawa. It's a uh, you know, my house in Samawa, in the center of Samawa, uh, a few yards from Euphrates rivers, mm -hmm. um, where we used to swim and, you know, spend a lot of good time there. Uh, it's, a, it's about like a 25 miles away from Oroch. Oroch, okay. Uh, from, sorry, from, yeah, Oroch. Yes. Yeah, um, al Warka. al Warka, yeah. Oh, and it's uh, probably 70 miles north of Ur. So we are talking about, you know, the, the capitals of uh, Sumerian Sumeria. and Akkad Akkadian and, and, you know, mm -hmm. all this rich civilization in, uh, in, in Iraq. Uh, and you can smell it. You can see it. Mm -hmm. It's not only the historical sites, but you can see it. You can trace it the way how the farmers doing their, you know, performing their, their daily life. Yes. You can see it in their customs. You can see it in their words, just like what, when, you yeah. know, the, the words that you mention it. Mm -hmm. So this rich history, um, sometimes it become a burden. And thus we can probably address it when we talk about the, you know, my later education. Okay, we'll yeah. talk about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you remind me of the Pope' v recent visit to uh, what was it the the uh, Prophet Abraham uh, birthplace? Yes, yes, uh, that's that's where so that's like a seventy mile south of my house. It's 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 really amazing to see how many people around the world have some ties to the beginning of civilization or cradle of religions, uh, Abrahamic religions in the region, but um, you know. Going back to, um, you know, transitioning from the 70s to the 80s, uh, I want to go back and, 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 and focus on, so now you went from high school in Samawa and you, you moved alone to even more south, to Basra. Uh, can you talk about uh, that experience and, and, and uh, how, how did you really start chemical engineering in the University of Basra? Well, again, my, my journey with Basra started you know, way before that, you know, first mm -hmm. year I moved to Samawa, I was in, you know, in uh, eighth grade, mm -hmm. seventh grade, yeah, between, yeah, the summer between seventh and eighth grade, we had a picnic, you know, going to, um, to Basra, and alone I explored the city, and stick in my mind, you know, it was, again, we are talking about mid-1970s, there is no war in Basra in that time. Mm -hmm. The war up north, you know, in, 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 in the north of Iraq, you know. But in Basra in that time, the only port for Iraq where you can walk on the bank of river of Shat al-Arab and easily see, you know, uh, uh, ships and, and, and from all around the world. You can see people talking different language you can see from japan from brazil from uk from africa from europe from all other arab nations you can see the products coming from all around the world so that city and again i'm not talking about the history of the basra basra it's originated in the first couple decades in the islam second decade probably in the islam um, initiated same time the kufa the recent kufa initiated mm -hmm. Like, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 13 and 17 Hijri. Yeah. Um, but since that time, it become a center of, um, you know, um, uh, um, scholar of thoughts, 
center of uh, religious leaders, center of poets. Uh, poet. Mm -hmm. You can see even in the uh, traditional Arab grammar, there is, there is, you know, all around Arab world, there is two schools. Al-Madrasa al-Basriya and Al-Madrasa al-Kufiya. Sure. You know, school of Basra, school of Kufa. Kufa. Uh, again, when you see that city, mix the history and geography, you can see the world in that city. Um, I went to Abu al-Khasib in that time. It was a jungle of, you know, um, you can see many type of products and fruits. We don't usually grow it in Iraq. You know, bananas, and you can see, you know, too many type of um, cultural mixed in that city. Uh, so I visited uh, the uh, Al Sindibad Island. I visited, you know, many sites in the city mid 1970s, and I decided, even I was in middle school, I decided my bachelor will be in Basra. In Basra. So you love the city. I love it. Even mm -hmm. I was accepted in Baghdad University. I decided to go to Basra. Go Basra. Then my journey started, and again, it's when, unfortunately, you know, I'm talking about, uh, you know, early 1980s, where the um, Iran-Iraq war, war just started. started yeah. So that, you know, magic image, I had it in my dream for Basra when I saw it in mid-1970s, that, you know, that image, it's totally changed. While you were there. As yes, a yes. Yeah. During, during so the war started when you when you were there. Yeah, yeah. it started a year and but, a half before. But I, it, it was haven't there. reached Basra yet. So when it reached Basra, how was your experience? Um, well, again, you know, there is another thing. This first time, you know, living living out of my family, mm -hmm. uh, again exploring the the life of university. Uh, it was a, a new department, chemical engineering. Uh, in that time, we had a, a lot of non-Iraqis professors. So, you know, the, the curriculum in English and, and, and the classes in English, um, and it's, a, it's a, um, 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 a heavy curriculum, but um, uh, we enjoy the life over there. However, uh, we are just a few miles away from the war. From the front lines, yeah. Yes. So um, that's mixed feeling. One, from one hand, you look at, uh, you think of a bright future ahead of you as a chemical engineer. It's, a, you know, for Iraq, chemical engineer, it's, it's a good, good career. Um, Iraq, again, you know, oil country. And, you, oil. And, and we had a, a lot of industries in that time. So you can, you can find... Um, uh, a lot of a lot of area where you can probably um, mm -hmm. um, start your career with innovation, with with uh, you know with blessing. Yeah. And from the other hand, um, you know there is a big big uh, devil mouth, so to speak, which is the war. Yeah. You have to go to the military after you graduate. So, so it's compulsory. It's like you don't have an yes, option. Yes, yes. It's not an optional. Mm -hmm. So that's the second part of 1980s, almost second part. I had to spend it in Basra again, but in the in the in the military. In the military. Yeah. yeah. So um, talking about the economy, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Although Iraq had a lot of oil and gas, in the beginning. Oil and gas was diverted all of it to a fund that was managed, and the economy really relied on non-oil and gas uh, GDP independence, right? Yes. Can you talk about how did that work and when was the shift from that balance? Yeah, and um, again, you know, Iraq called historically Ard al-Sawad, you know, the black land. You know, by black land, they mean the tar. The no, they mean it's a it's a heavy agriculture area. You know, people coming from Bedouin, from the uh -huh. desert, they see you know concentrated uh, palm trees to the level they don't see it as a green. They see it as a black. You know, full of black because you know, of dense, 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 yes, dense. You know, yes, yes. dense agriculture area. Yeah. So we are again. We are talking about thousands of years, hundreds mm. of years, where Iraq is. Uh, uh, basketful 
for the for the region. Um, again, unfortunately, by mid of fifties, when the oil start, uh, you know, bringing more uh, revenue for the government. But in that time, we had a constitutional kingdom, so they cannot play too much with the fund without the you know without the parliament without the people um, uh, you know uh, opinion and we had a we had a decent uh, leadership um, you know in that time where they decided to create that fund for building Iraq you know majlis al imar reconstruction so the oil fund come mainly to that uh, the oil revenue come to that fund and that fund you can trace their um, uh, achievements even decades after that fund mm -hmm. dissolves so, yeah. um, unfortunately after 1958 there was a military coup and then another military coup in 1963 which was also bloody so Abdul Karim Qasim is the first one? First one, and then Second one is Abdul Salam Arif and the Ba'ath Party joined together. Oh. And they, they, you know, they also made a, a lot of, a lot of uh, damage to the society, not only killing a lot of people and eliminate, uh, eliminating a lot of oppositions, you know, include communists, include, uh, you know, others. But uh, after that, another cope in 1968, where the Ba'ath Party came back again mm. uh, with what they call it white revolution, which has turned to be more bloody than the previous ones. Mm -hmm. um, um, during that movement in 1960s and then 1970s, gradually the oil play key role in the GDP. And mm -hmm. again, nationalizing the industry, that was in 1964, uh, nationalizing the banking system. Then after that, you know, when the Ba'ath Party came back in 1968, another form of nationalizing, you know, I told you nationalizing education, journalists, unions, uh, liberal life. Um, so the government become taking care of the people, so to speak, mm -hmm. and interfere in their life from the birth to death. Um, I remember, you know, in, 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 you know, in university, you have to fill a form. That form dictates where you're going to go work. And mm -hmm. you have to go to a specific work that the government assigned it for so, you. Yeah. Um, so so it's, a, it's a long story, but we end up with turning the um, promising future for Iraq to a mm -hmm. disaster. Uh, I don't know who, who said that, but they, they said uh, 1980, 1981 was the, 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 the peak of, of, of the Iraqi, if you say, um, um, her, um, social revolution, educational revolution, and then the declining has begun. Uh, I do remember when I was in college, <clears throat> one of my professors, Dr. Qandil, I was a student at King Fahd University of Petroleum and Minerals, he said he studied in Iraq, uh, and he, he, he talks about how wonderful it was. I have another physics professor, uh, I think from Algeria or Morocco, he said that his dream was to go to Iraq to study, which didn't happen. Why the education in Iraq was so strong that all the Arabs wanted to study there? Well, again, as you can easily say, or see the the education system you cannot build it uh, overnight it takes years it right? takes years and generations sometimes mm -hmm. i mean you can start any time but the f real fruit you can harvest it probably within a couple generations it takes generations to build scholars to build um you know education culture um what you see it you mentioned early 1980s that was a fruit of what built late 1940s, 40s, yeah. 50s. You know, when people like Dr. Ali Wardi came here to yeah, UT Texas. Austin. Yes. yes. Or uh, Dr. Fadl Jamali or mm. 
hundreds of professors, Iraqis in medicine, in engineering, in management, in, 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 in finance, in, you know, all physics, mm. you know, from MIT, from Harvard, from Yale, from, you know, many other great universities here in U.S. and even in, in U.K. and other, other part of the world. They came back <coughs> with the, you know, with the knowledge, with the with the know how yeah. with the expertise. You know, all those people help to build that reputation. Yeah. Um, so the people come again. I remember when I was in university, you know, uh, in Basra. Um, it's easily you go to the um, you know to the cafe or to the student union or you go to the dorm. Always, you can see people from the Gulf, you know, from Bahrain, from Saudi, from oh, different up to yeah, from Morocco, from Africa, from India, oh, from wow. yeah, 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 That's too amazing. many people. And when we talk about the health system, you know, you know, ironically, right now you can see thousands of Iraqis going, you know, outside of Iraq sure. in the neighbor countries or far to get their health uh, services. In that time, you know, Iraqi hospitals attracted, um, you know, uh, patients from all around the region. Uh, if, if I recall, uh, to give the universities in Iraq its justice, not only the people who studied there came and built, a lot of people who actually studied in Iraqi universities have contributed it outside. One of them is a physics professor in uh, New York. Uh, one one comes to mind specifically is Dr. Farouk Al Qasim. I think he is graduate of the University of Basra, right? Um, I think yeah. He, yeah, and then, and then he finished, did he he graduate his education uh, in UK. In UK yeah. then, yeah. and uh, he's considered the the, the father of uh, oil and gas uh, industry in Norway. Sure. Uh, so the the fingerprint of Iraqis, you know, whether it's in, in, in national level or international level, is obvious, uh, and and hopefully this comes back uh, now. Going back to education and the point we stopped at, so now you finished your education, you went to the military, the the war is winding down, you're about to get a job, so you got a job. Uh, can you talk about that job and then in the 1991, you, there was another <laughs> another event and you're back into uh, in stabilization, I guess. Yeah, it, you know, I get a job and... Um, in the Ministry of Industry as a production engineer in a cement factory. Um, it was a very nice job, closer to my house, you know, mm. almost walking from my house to the factory. Walking distance. Yeah, I mean, it's a walking yeah. distance. Rarely I use the car. But again, it's a, it's a, it's give me that sense of, you know, settling down after all this move. Mm. I get married and I get my uh, first uh, uh, son and things, you know, we thought, uh, again, I, I, I would mention the, 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 the Iraq-Iran war, it was destroy the Iraq economy. It, it was, was destroy, years, yeah. yeah. So everybody thought Iraq is not gonna have any war for next 50 years or 100 years. It's a big lesson. There was a big shock too. It is, but, but unfortunately, um, against what all, what we thought, the dictator didn't pay attention to that and didn't learn that lesson. So um, he invaded Kuwait in August, early August 1990. And we had, uh, you know, we had um, one of the um, um, dilemma where he destroyed our neighbor and also, um, you know, um, resisting to withdraw and uh, led to what happened to Iraq, destroying all the, you know, bridges and um, infrastructure and, you know, um, roads and buildings and hospitals. And we had a huge, huge problem in that time. Mm. Um, that led even people who tend not to interfere in politics usually, even those people decided to just like, you know, say it loudly, enough, enough is enough. enough. Yeah. And that's what happened when, when you know, we in um, about 14 provinces from 18 uprise against uh, 
uh, you know, the regime. Um, early spring uh, 2000, uh, 1991, which what call Intifada Adar or Intifada Shabaniya, which is, you know, um, thousands of Iraqis, you know, decided to say their words. Unfortunately, the um, reaction was uh, from the world was silent. And from the regime was tough and rude and brutal. Um, he used, you know, rockets and, 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 and um, helicopters and to destroy the cities, include, uh, you know, holy shrines and religious sites and um, hundreds of thousands of people uh, lost their life in that, you know, in that moment. In that moment, you know, from the beginning of of uh, 1991 to the almost like end of April, you know, all these four months between the war to liberate Kuwait um, uh, to the Iraqi uprising against Saddam mm -hmm. to the reaction from the government, you know, putting the shutting down the uprising. Mm. Um, the outcome was a mass grave for thousands and thousands of civilians. For people who couldn't flee. Yeah. I lost a lot of friends, colleagues, include, you know, um, um, brilliant engineers, you know, relatives. Um, um, again, you know, religious scholars, you know, um, people from villages all around the Euphrates middle mm -hmm. Euphrates area and the south, again, from Basra to up up north in, in Kirkuk and, and, and... So it was all people from all over the country? All ar over the country, except a couple uh, cities. Um, unfortunately, again, um, that had to um, kind of mass escaping from Iraq, you know. Mm. You see a couple millions of people left to the border of Turkey, Turkey. and Iran and... We were in the west south, so west. we had to go from the Saudi area mm. where the um, uh, coalition uh, forces were forces there. Back, yeah. And I had to, to leave the country. Okay. Now, before we talk about this segment, was this around the time when the marshes, when a lot of people had refuge in the marshes and the marshes were wiped out? It happened, you know, soon after that, you know. Okay. Some of the people, uh, include myself, we had to go, you know, to leave the cities. And I, I was separated from, you know, my family. And I'm, I didn't see them um, from the uprising and, you know, until, until 1996. So, so, you, so this was what year you left the country? Uh, 1991. 1991. Yeah, early 1991. So I tried to go to the marshes area. Unfortunately, the road closed and mm. the uh, um, you know regime army was there. So some of the people went down to Safwan. Walking and foot. Yeah, walking. You can see hundreds of thousands wow. of kids and women and you know all people in that time. It was spring, mm. but it was cold in the night mm. and hot in the, in day. the day. Yeah. Anyway, so, so many of people find their way later oh. in refugee camps um, in both sides, you know, one of them closer to Kuwaiti border and the other one Saudi border. Uh, the other oh. people, lucky people, went to also find their way through Turkey or through Iran. And again, by end of it, we had to leave the country. I have to leave it um, and start another chapter of my life. Oh, I want to talk about something when you talk about economy and, and the geopolitics of war, what's built in the 30s and 40s that led to the flourishing in 50, 60 years basically was turned down in about 10 years. Yeah. And when you tear something down in 10 years, you need another 50 to 70 years to rebuild, giving the fact that there is a stability. Because without a stability, economics economic stability or political stability, forget that 70 years. From, from an insider who lived through prosperity, had a job to see this crumbling down, to flee Iraq, to... How old was your son when you left Iraq? Three months. Three months. So you saw him in 96 and... He's six years old. Six years old. 
There's so many questions around this. I want to start with the following. What gave you hope to see all of this, experience it, then come back? We'll talk about when you came back and, and, and your journey back then. But I want, I want to explore three aspects here. Mm-hmm. What kept you positive? What, what is the work you've done between leaving and, 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 and returning? And how do you hold on to the thought of there's work to be done, then I want to go back and build the country with other people? Just the umbrella of all of this is the thought process, the ups and downs, the negative and positive, the human emotions, the ocean of issues, just, I know it's too much to talk about. Just a thought. How, how did you explore this? Well, first of all, um, again, um, in addition to the set of belief, the faith, we are here not for uh, a random journey. I believe, you know, we are here for a purpose. So every single day when I wake up, I'm supposed to have a to-do list. I ha- I supposed to have, you know, um, uh, things that I need to accomplish it during that day. Regardless, if I'm in a university or in a working in a government or working in a private sector, if I'm uh, um, acting as a grandfather or as a, uh, you know, um, typical citizen, every single day I have a purpose for the life. When I go through challenges and difficulties, my readings to the history supported me when I see how civilization started and grow and come down. Mm. When I see millions of people around the world, not now only, but even in the history, they went through whatever I feel it's a challenge, they might feel more challenge mm. than what I feel. And many of them, they went through it successfully. Mm. So I truly believe there is a purpose in this life. And that what motivate me every single day. When I look at those great building damage in Iraq or these bridges or these, mm. you know, accumulated layers of civilization stalling or, or, or damaged or destroyed. It's a sad and sometimes depressing. Mm. But I also look at it from a different angle. Okay, this is opportunity for us to rebuild it, mm. probably better than it was. So... Um, I keep my motivation. I remember, you know, um, people exchange a greeting during the Eid, you know, mm. the, the festival. Um, everybody talk about his personal, you know, um, wish. Um, I remember late 1990s in Arizona, we had a gathering for Salat al-Eid and everybody come together. And everybody say his, his you know, um, uh, wishful, you know, um, uh, again, all, all of it focused on a local things. Mm. I asked them for al-awda. Oh. Yeah. Wish the, us, the return. Wish, wish me, wish me the return. Mm. And I said, and some of them, they make, you know, they, they laugh at it and they say, are you still dreaming? You are going mm. back, you know, you know, the grandson of Saddam will stay in the power. I told them, just, just, Look at the history. You cannot see a dictators or um, um, uh, uh, um, an injustice rulers stay forever. Okay, so the cycle of history, in a short, in a few words, the sci- reading the cycle of histories motivate people even during their difficult time and gives them hope for a better future. So, so basically you had, you had three pillars that, that sustained you um, to, to really think 
in a positive way, which is spirituality, uh, self-care, and, you know, those both will affect the body. So three pillars, right? Yeah. Now, when do you think about being spared from the, the, the mass graves? Um, how, how do you think of this idea? You know, m they found many mass graves after 2003. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about just this notion of, you know, I could have been there? Again, it's 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 a sad when I remember, you know, um, for example, one of my colleagues, classmate, but he's he's very close friend to me, Mohammed Hussein Abdul Razak. He's uh, he's a brilliant young student. Um, he finished his bachelor degree with me in, in chemical engineering. Then he pursued his nuclear uh, degree. Um, they killed him in 1991 in the shrine of Imam Hussein. And his family, until this moment, couldn't find trace his body. I have a lot of stories about friends, uh, you know, people who knew them, and definitely even more people we don't know them. You know, some of these mass graves in Al Hilla area, uh, when they discover them, um, you can see the the remains of two years old, five years old, seven years old. You know. Mm -hmm. Very young kids, you can see women, you can see old people, you know, with their IDs, some of them without IDs, and, you know, um, between Karbala and Najaf, between Samawa. And again, this the story of regime, you know, mass graves, it's not a new, it's not only in the, uh, in, you know, uprising time, although it was the main of it. But even before that, you, you go to uh, the desert area, Salman, you can see... Uh, a lot of uh, uh, graves for Kurdish people, you know, who mm. brought them from the north. And again, I'm talking about women and kids and, 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 mm. and, and, and old people. Um, so the impression that you, in addition to, the, to this sadness, you also feel you are responsible mm. for two things. People tend to look at when they see like this, they think of revenge. I focus on something else. How could we prevent this, you know, um, um, crimes against humanity from happening again? That is what motivates me um, to think of what's the best system that will prevent such a crimes. Mm. And that system, based on my education, based on my experience, based on what I have seen in the world, need to depend on institutions rather than individuals. We're, we're 2023, we're sitting here in Houston, and unfathomable what I hear but because I am from the region, I know we heard. But when I was preparing for this, I, of course I've seen before, but when I go to YouTube, it is unreal, the footage and the video of the stuff that happened in the 80s and in the 90s. And it is, um, I thank you for shedding a light on that because as much I, I would like to say we learn from history, at least it's our duty to remind people that all of us has a role in contributing to live peacefully together, understanding the differences and embracing our differences to advance humanity. So I know it's hard for you to talk about this and I brought you memories from 40, 50 years ago, but thank you for sharing this. Now, we want to go to a time of, of your studies. So you came to the U.S., you came to Arizona uh, early 90s, and you completed your studies uh, in chemical engineering, majoring in semiconductors. Uh, and you worked many years for the semiconductor industry. Can you talk about this period? Well, again, it's, um, it's, it's, it's um, very interesting. Again, you know, escaping wars and, 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 and survival from um, mass graves. 
than um, another pleasant news for me. You know, my wife and my son rejoined me back. Um, so um, I can probably, um, it's difficult for me to, you know, to be thankful for that, grateful for that. However, um, working in a semiconductor, uh, it's also uh, very interesting. Mm. Um Remember, we are talking about mid 1990s and you know late 1990s, where the technology booming and 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 um, uh, I started as a, a design engineer for um, one of the um, world leaders, uh, subcontractor for the um, packaging for the uh, chip for the system that. Um, be part of your cell phone. Remember, we are talking about an early, early generation, generation of cell phone. Uh, we are talking about almost every microelectronic piece. You know, your phone, your mic microphone, your mm -hmm. camera, your, you know, your um, airplane, your car, your almost, you know, every everywhere. Um, um, then I moved from from being a um, design engineer. You know, work little bit in R&D, which is another world. You know, when you go down in the beginning on the micron level to nano level, and you can see, you know, kind of cities um, uh, designed inside a small little uh, chip or package. Uh, it's, again, um, every day it was a challenge from um, uh, uh, envisioning what's what's the next and what's the what's the possible difficulties that's going to face people when they use this or that device so you not only design for today challenge to solve today challenges but also you think of what's tomorrow's challenges i remember late 1990s we studies um, the roadmap for semiconductor at that time, we're talking about the time from 2016 to 2022 or mm. 24. So it's almost like a quarter century ahead. Uh, I learned a lot. And also, it's, you know, because it's, an, um, it's a global company, we have uh, most of our si factories, you know, in Asia. We have a sites in Europe. We have a sites here in different area. You know, being in contact, closer contact in Silicon Valley, where I get another um, uh, certificates and study uh, signal integrity specifically. Um, that's amazing. You know, for me, it's it's a blessing. Um, you meet a lot of people from all around the world. You study their cultures, their needs, and also their ambitions, their barriers, their limitations, their constraints, their thoughts. So it's. You know, every day I was going to the work, I, you know, expecting and I'm going to learn in addition to the, you know, technologies and, 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 and you know, technical themes and uh, concepts, but also I'm going to learn more about a human. That's interesting. So, so every day was just a new challenge. You were looking forward to, you know, learning something new or a new experience or a new interaction with, with the with the, with the team now uh i want to go back before we, we we go to this i want to go back to why semiconductors oh that's a it's a funny story i don't know it, it's um you know i was planning to go to biomedical engineering okay and then something happened for the last moment and then <laughs> i turned to semiconductor remember arizona in that time it's very close to california and mm -hmm. a lot of companies start moving from california to arizona mm -hmm. uh, blue chips you know you know all those uh, 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 you know motorola there intel there you know um, uh, amcor technology there mm -hmm. many many other companies start moving to arizona and then they decided to um, establish a program that uh, combine a, a prog new program focused on semiconductor 
but it's combining of different you know background like chemical engineering mechanical engineering electrical engineering material etc so the people who graduate from that master program um, they can easily work together with with different type of engineering or even sales and and um, you know marketing and so it's it's, it's wide your perspective but on a specific area. Okay, area. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So people, uh, uh, people in that program were all from the U.S. or was like, oh yeah, uh, most of them from U.S. Yes. but some of them from different countries. Different countries. Yes. Okay. So so uh, during that time, I remember uh, late '90s when I, uh, my dad is a handyman. I mean, he's an indicator, but he, he he likes to do things, you know, at the house or in the farm. And he, whenever I go buy something, he, he, this is what he tells me, buy American product. I'm like, why is like quality? It's like, it's expensive, but it's quality, it lasts longer. Your work in manufacturing, I know <laughs> at that time, there was a, there was a, there was a segment in, in the economy where the start of shipping jobs overseas outsourcing uh, outsourcing uh did you live through this can you talk about it <laughs> yeah I, I, again i don't know if, if this is something that uh, see see by end of it um if you remember you know china just enter to the um, um you know world economy world stage yeah, yeah um, late 1980s you know 1990s so that's a um, um a, a great time you know for companies to look at it from economic you know um, uh, perspective yeah perspective mm -hmm. um, it's it's um, you know cheap laborers and also they lower the restrictions so it's a kind of version version land and mm -hmm. I'm not talking about China only but I'm talking about the you know the general area yeah you know we're talking about South Korea we're talking about Malaysia we're talking about Philippines you know mm. and definitely Singapore and, and, and Taiwan Hong Kong etc and Japan so so the area was attracting the business not only from US from Europe mm. as well from other part of the world so so that's the phenomena of outsourcing probably reached their peak, at least from last century, uh, when people anticipating a big problem called Y2K, which is, uh, you know, the beginning of using the computer, they put two digits for the year. So um, mm. 88, whatever, 70, whatever, mm. then comes, to 99, okay, oops, we need four digits. So a lot of system need to be transfer because after 99, it's gonna come, you know, double zero. The zero, zero, yeah. So what does that mean, 1900 or 2000? So again, it's, it's a, we don't look at it right now in a, a big deal, mm -hmm. but in that time, kind of panic. That's also push a lot of work uh, specifically to India. You know, mm. for IT's companies, IT. you know, startup companies, because governments and, 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 you know, private sectors, companies, they, they have a very short deadlines. They need to meet it mm. to upgrade their system. So, again, um, so from, from an economic perspective, from an urgency perspective, from a um, legal slash um, procedure perspective, that uh, help, um, you know, um, moving the outsourcing. I was again, in, in my company, we, I remember we had a, a around two hundred fifty uh, design engineers and design center. We ended up to, tw you know, down shrinking them to twelve. Wow. Yeah, I mean, many many companies they started to shut down their sites. I mean, many industries. It's not only in semiconductor. You know, yeah, many, can, many industries did the same thing. Many industries, you know, went, uh, you know, some somewhere. I mean, they usually move here between state to state based on tax yeah. and, 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 and privileges and, and, and initiative that, you know, competes mm -hmm. each state. Then they, they, they decided to go there. Well, well, the idea a lot of economists argue is, is the efficiency curve. And, and when the world opens up to other countries, it becomes cheap, cheap labor and, you know, resource allocation becomes key because 
you know, it is cheaper there, and this is the, the economical model that, that companies basically pursue. Now, um, something interesting along your journey uh, and mentioning uh, South Korea, I, I, one of my first jobs or early jobs uh, I started in Qatar was in Saeed Industrial City, and this was in 2005. Uh, I, I do remember working for a Korean company, LG Engineering Construction, and my site manager comes to me one day. He doesn't speak. His English is broken. He pick up his shirt and he shows me a bullet. And he's like, look, from the war, you know. Uh, and, and I was mesmerized by the work ethics. They woke up at 4.30 in the morning. Everybody have to go outside and, sure. like, train. Sure. And, and I'm bringing this idea because there are stories when they talk about the 50s. Uh, another Another... Site manager, uh, IH Kim, he says, I do remember when I was a kid, people used to knock on our doors asking for food. Wow. Now, when you look today at Korea, it's a totally different country. Yeah. S South Korea. Mm -hmm. Now, you, do, you did live in, in Iraq in an era where Iraq was a different country. You went through the downfall. You came to the U.S. with all of this. So much noise, so much stability. You've seen both end of the spectrum. Can you talk about why did you choose your next career to be uh, in um, uh, commercial attache and the Iraqi embassy? And how did you start to pursue a career in institutional reform and social economic policy? Well, first of all, you know, I, I think I mentioned, you know, anybody need to have a change. You can do, you can do it in an individual base, or you can do it in organization base or institution base. Um, based on my personal experience, and also based on reading the, you know, how 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 the world developed, if we tend to rely on individuals, um, that's unsustainable and many times inefficient for implementing change. Uh, the other hand, if we help building institutions, mm. healthy institutions, um, um, efficient institutions, that will make the change more efficient and more sustainable. So I decided to study this, you know, um, um, learning from my experience in a large corporation, um, learning from my experience, I mean, comparing the education system here and what happened to our education system lately. Um, so that pushed me in that direction. Um, that's the way, you know, probably later I, I write a book for why nation fails. I mean, obviously, you know, um, nation fails because there's a different type of um, organization, institutions, uh, some of them uh, exclusive and some of them inclusive. So that's, again, this is, a, this is one of the motivation to go through this direction, um, you know, um, uh, studying the management and how the international organi organizational leaderships, um, you know, I also study um, different cases from a countries being in a wars, in an invasion, in a mm -hmm. sanctions, in a in a situation, or even internal conflicts. You know, we always mention Japan and Germany. You you mentioned just mentioned Korea. We can mention you know many other countries. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, Chile. Mm. And went through a lot of you know internal conflicts and mm. kind of civil war and military interference and you know thousands of people lost their life but look at chile their democratic mm. system now more mature and also their yeah. economy and you can go in europe um east europe after after the shift in yeah. late 1990s again the the stories mm. all around the world it tells you, you know, building healthy, efficient institutions so that, that will help more. Now, in terms of my personal <coughs> uh, move, 
again, after 2003, um, I wasn't part of, you know, the, the effort to put Saddam down. I, you know, I decided, um, you know, I was, you know, supporting putting Saddam's regime down, but I wasn't with, you know, um, with the military interference because um, the lesson of 1991, uh, it was always in my mind, you know, reminded me of how the, again, the, the people lost their faith uh, about the international help uh. to put Saddam down. However, the things went, um, you know, Saddam went out of the picture, which is great. Um, you know, a lot of people like myself were happy that Saddam removed, but also we were, um, you know, s uh, very concerned about what's the next. Uh. We had a kind of difficult time from 2000 three to 2007 we were mm. kind of in the middle of civil war um then um the the i decided in that difficult time to go back to join the effort to settling the iraq and helping them and reshifting the focus of the people from intangible thing to um you know focusing on education and economy and building themselves uh, bringing their heritage back as a um, as a positive contributor to the region and the world. Um, I work a year as an advisor for the government, and then they ask me to open the commercial attache in Washington um, after two decades of closing. So I open with a small team, and 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 my journey uh, about seven eight years um, in Washington started there. That's amazing. Uh, there is rumors. I don't know if they're true or not. They say that, that you have kids in Capitol Hill. <laughs> <laughs> well, How accurate is that statement? Well, um, and during my service as a commercial attaché, you know, my office separate than the embassy. I have a separate office. Um, I had a very small Iraqi team. Uh, unfortunately, some of them they don't speak English, and and they were not familiar with the you know the system here. And I had a lot of ambitious, you know, ambitions and try to, you know, go fast and try to present Iraq to, to the, you know, U.S. companies and U.S. people and try to, you know, make them engage. Um, so I have, I don't have budget to hire people the way how I want. So I created a small program. I have a couple of friends in Washington, uh, George Washington University, Georgetown University, you know, local universities mm. over there, American University in, in Washington, D.C., George Mason. So then I start hiring um, um, interns. And my journey with the interns, um, every semester, I, you know, we select um, 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 uh, a few of, you know, many people apply for that position. The good thing, you know, we we mentor them in their education, but also we help them to, um, you know, study the Iraqi problems mm -hmm. and try to find a similar, um, you know, cases, uh, um, uh, proposed solutions. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a very um, a great opportunity for me as well, you know, to mentor those kids. Um, you know, I treat them just like my son and, you know, um, but... Um, many of them, they graduated and then they start working all around the city. Mm. Uh, so that's so, that's what, what yeah. he means. OK. Now, when, when we talk about the era uh, after uh, being a commercial attache, uh, you've done that for how many years? About you uh, from 2008, early 2008 to 2014, August oh, wow. 14. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, kind of eight years. Eight years. <laughs> now, uh, uh, after that, you, you, you went back to Iraq. And uh, you, can you talk more about your role as chief of staff for the prime minister, Haider uh, um, al-Abadi, and, and, and being a senior advisor for the prime minister as well? Well, again, I was, um, you know, I was um, um, also very sad when the news came and June 10th of 2014, when the Mosul fall mm. uh, by ISIS, Daesh, and uh, 
often, uh, you know, a lot of people like myself anticipate that something will happen. You know, I wrote an article and decided to publish it in the the um, state newspaper, al Sabah, um, for three months before the Mosul fall. I anticipated three things. One of them, um, I said, in, in that time, the oil prices, like, around between 130 to 140 one time. Oh, okay. So um, I said, be careful, you know, it's gonna be collapse. And our economy built on the oil and especially the big part of the budget, mm. the mass majority of the budget came from the oil. So we're gonna be in a very, very difficult situation. Mm. So don't plan for um, um, kind of ambitious budget. Uh, and as always, I'm pushing toward diversifying the economy. The other thing I anticipated, which is happened two or three months after that article, um, I said I can easily see there is a geopolitical vacuum and things happen, and a lot of attempt it might try to remove borders and things. Mm. Again, uh, the problem happened in, in, in Mosul Fall, it's not an isolated Event. Uh, event. Things happened probably six or seven months or even a year before that, you know, when mm. some of those jihadist groups, you know, turn from Al-Qaeda to the Dawla Islamiyah and then, you know, it's, it's, you can watch it. You can watch, you can watch the move, you know, the move and you can link the puzzles pieces together and you can, you can see the shape. A lot of people, they try, they tend not to see the big picture and they might lose that focus and and then they become you know um shocked when something happened although it's 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 still you know uh, a city um um very large city like mosul um you know fall in in, in a couple of days um it's it's a very sad event um then there is a, a decision to shift in the leadership after the election so mm -hmm. the nominated prime minister in that time, Dr. Haider Ibadi, sent me a, a message and asked me to join his team. Um, in that time, I was in Rockville Hospital, you know, expecting, you know, a new baby with my wife. And so I, I asked him, can I come like three, four more weeks from now? He said, no, no, I need you now. So I had to leave. Um, I went back there. Um, I this remember, was after the fall of Mosul? Yes, it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, two months after the fall of the Mosul. Uh, you know, third week of August, you know, mm -hmm. second, third week of August when they nominated him. So I went there, helped him and, you know, other, uh, other uh, team to put a new government. And then uh, started my journey over there. Um, Ibadi's government um, uh, faced not only the military challenges and security challenges where a lot of, you know, car bombs in Baghdad and many mm. other cities, you know, the level of the um, uh, sectarianism escalated, you know, mm. because remember the the theme that ISIS Daesh um, put played it, on is, is sectarianism. Sectarianism. With the Yazid, uh, as the Yazidis. As yeah, these, uh, no, yeah. Um, the, again, it's Shia, Shia again, it's, you know, uh, even Sunnis who Sunnis are not too, yeah. aligned to their set mentality, yeah. mentality or set of belief. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a lot of challenges. The other challenges is uh, the economic crisis. You know, the oil fr prices yeah, went down to the level we don't have enough money to not only to uh, to operate the war, but also to the level we cannot pay the salaries of our soldiers or fighters, mm. uh, include the volunteers. Uh, and even, uh, you know, to add salt to the injury, so to speak, um, the previous government had a thousands of projects, you know, ambitious plans to, you know, we had to stop all these projects. So remember, there is a lot of depreciation in the in the projects when mm. you stop them. Sure. So you, what you have to get make a decision. I mean, you, mm. you don't have resources for that, and then you have to go work with the international partners, uh, like the World Bank, IMF, and others, 
you know, it's not only donors, but also you need them to stand with Iraq during the war. Mm. Uh, we help building the coalition, um, and people trust the new leadership for Iraq, and then try to also stand with Iraq because the the danger of Daesh was not only for Iraq or Iraqis; it's also for the region, but, but also for the world. Mm-hmm. Um, other challenge that uh, you know our government faced in that time faced uh, was the the integrity of the country was threatened. Mm. You know when when Daesh went to the Mosul and went to area closer to Kirkuk, closer to Erbil, closer you know to the uh, north of Iraq, the Kurdistan, mm. Iraqi Kurdistan region, um, there was a gradually there was a there was a um, um, uh, attempt you know um, manifested later which is for a referendum as a first step for separation for independent Kurdistan mm. as a different state I don't remember that era actually. yeah so so all these challenges it's it's a it's a it's not a small tactic challenges. It's, it's a, a cat- s- catastrophe. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, and you have, so you have the economy, you have ISIS, you have this separation, and you have the societies. I remember Spiker happened. I remember... Yeah. Mass graves. Mass graves. I mean, how do you remember this time? And what was your interaction? I, I know uh, Dr. Haider Abadi have a book. I do uh, glimpse some of it, and he talks about... President Obama told him it was hard for him to, to convince the administration to support, which he did later on, but because, you know, there was the the, 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 the 91 war, there was the 2003 war, and, and he was trying to get out of Iraq. Can you talk about that time? How did you all convince the international community to collaborate because this was an international threat? Well, first of all, some of the, you know, the claims that the international community thought about it some of it it's not real and some of it is true i mean when they talk about the inefficiency for spending the money in iraq that's true we had a um, um, uh, um, a very very large problem of corruption so when you have a team that have a form an um, agenda to uh, fight the corruption using the international expertise using the international um, forensic n- investigators you know we told them okay we have a problem you can blame from now until whenever it's not going to solve the problem we recognize the problem if you are serious about iraq you know go go and uh, i mean come and, and help us let's work together to solve the problem when we talk about Daesh, we have not have a short in fighters. You know, Iraqis, you know, um, old people, young people from villages in Basra, Nasiriyah, Samawa, Imara, you know, all around Iraq, you know, Baghdad, all of them volunteer to fight to the level we cannot, you know, we cannot handle the level of volunteers. Mm-hmm. But also, we don't have, um, you know, enough weapons. We don't have enough training. We don't have know-how. We, you know, there was a lot of shortage in the military system. Remember, um, a brigades collapsed in a few hours, and many of them they left their weapons. And so, so it's it's a it's a big challenges. But when you talk to the world, with open heart and open mind and a clear agenda. We told them, this is our war, we're going to fight it. If you come to us, you will help us and reduce the bloods and reduce the time that we're going to put it in this war. Mm. That's one. Second, if we lose in this war, this will become a larger issue for them. It's going to be a larger issue um, I remember before I go to Iraq, like uh, a month after Mosul fall, I was in Washington. Um, one time in the Institute of the War, 
and they had a, a forum and people talking about how could we live with ISIS. Some of them talking about the money exchange with them, some of them border, and some of them even talk how far Daesh will go if they took Iraq and Turkey and whatever. So where are they going to stop in Europe? They're talking about something like a, a, a new wave that will take all the Islamic world. So people think that way. You know, even generals talk about this war is going to last for 30 years. We put a plan. This war needs to be down in next two, three years during our time. And they were talking about containing ISIS. We talk about eliminating Daesh or ISIS. Um, again, with, with a clear plan, clear vision, and commitment, we convince the world uh, leaders and we are, you know, we are proud that we, you know, accomplish our mission uh, that save millions of Iraqis and others. So, uh, coming out of this, uh, the impossible mission, as Dr. Abadi calls it, to be in the head of the Economic Reform Unit, ERU, in the Prime Minister's office. Uh, you played a significant role in, in, in designing and implementing the government economic reform agenda, where you can see the fruits today in the big projects in Baghdad and, and, and in Iraq in general. Can you tell us some of the initiatives that you guys worked on that had an impact in the economic uh, Iraq economy? Well, um, while we were working during the war in a fire, fighting mode, in a crisis mode. Uh, people, you know, work as a survivor, just try to survive. Nonetheless, at that time, we decided, okay, let's think of, in parallel, let's think of the day after, when the war is gonna be settled, what kind of challenges we're gonna face? So, we started, you know, putting the um, vision 2030. We start to put a project aim to create a real jobs. We have, you know, our calculation that time, half a million young people every year join the, to join the job markets, include graduated people and graduated people, half a million um, you cannot absorb them in a traditional way as mm. a government employee, the way how, you know, um, um, governments tend to do it as an easy way. On the other hand, the private sector has their own um, structural problems. The, the government doesn't work with the private sector the way how it should be. So we need to have a reform plan. Mm. What's the aim of that plan, you know? Um, diversifying the, our economy so um, you know getting a little bit out of the dependent heavy dependency on the on the oil also the um, the uh, the administration itself you know the 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 the, um, the bureaucracy of the Iraqi state some of it it's act um, uh, under Ottoman Empire um, codes, kind of codes and, yeah. and, and some of it from most of the codes inherited from the previous regime where the kind of social system um, so we need to, to think seriously of um, reforming the administration and, and administrative system um, and also we have something that we need to do it today before tomorrow it's not just only strategic thing Mm. which is how could we address the, the uh, basic necessities and needs that the Iraqis uh, wanted, you know, the basic service, electricity, you know, um, you know um, food, um, water, education, health, etc. Um, and we started one of the program that we started also streamlining the procedures, you know, starting from the um, annual report the World Bank used to put for ease of doing business reports. So we start, you know, um, reforming the uh, company registration, reforming the, um, you know, getting license uh, and, and, and some other stuff. So it was an ambitious 
projects include um, 50 plus uh, you know uh, piece your involvement in committees such as the national security council energy committee and restructuring and investment committee highlights the breadth of your involvement how did these diverse roles contribute to your understanding of the Iraqi socioeconomic landscape? Well, that's a good question. Um, always attending the high-level committees and meetings and be involved in a decision-making circle in a high level, always it's important. However, I do think I gain more from my engagement with the grassroots, mm. continuous, um, you know, communication, keeping the uh, channels open as possible with the grassroots, with the different communities, mm. with the different, you know, ages, different background, different, uh, with the variety of, of, of uh, stakeholders. Mm. Um, Again, especially with the, um, you know, um, large growing um, young Generation. generations, mm -hmm. that will help me uh, a lot uh, in term of the understanding the landscape of the Iraqi society. And be, being connected to the people too. Of course. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, the, the, um, those leaderships, who disengage with the realities, mm. with the grassroots, tend to make uh, silly mistakes and, and sometimes uh, brutal mistakes. Um, um, so specifically for, for a community, complicated you know, society mm. like Iraq, who just came out of war after war after war, from a conf you know internal conflict sanctions mm -hmm. um, you know um, where you know this type of societies usually had a you know even psychological uh, impact after getting out of wars yeah, and trauma yes. trauma mm. um, sometimes even don't you know when you get out of dictatorship mm. to you know, um, freedom, sometimes you face chaos. Yeah. Um, where the constraints, where the limits is vague and, and understandable. So so th this complexity require not only sitting in a closed rooms and bringing the theories, the best, you know, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, uh, theoretical approaches and aiming things will go through um, uh, smoothly. You remind me of an inter interview I've seen recently. Uh, I love poets, and I think poetry should be everywhere, even in politics. Uh, uh, with the Shar al-Iraqi, uh, Karim al-Iraqi, he was talking about, you know, he had humble beginnings. And his poetry was very influential because he used to work in, in, in a coffee shop mm -hmm. and every time friends come and talk about their stories he will just like repeat a poet for them uh, and he established connection with different part of society that his poetry became so influential because he was in touch by basically serving people tea sure and it, it does make a difference when you know, there's a famous saying uh, for Imam Ali that says, treat your kids with their generation. And it is very important which you mentioned because there was an era in the last 10 years in, in, in the Iraqi politics where being out of touch has created a lot of problems for, for, for policymakers. And this goes even in, in, in other countries, not only in, in Iraq. And this brings me to a point about uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, nice. <laughs> this is the, like, uh, 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 we can see the effect of AI in a mass scale today in Silicon Valley. And many layoffs even are contributed to the forecast of the effects of AI. 
where even diagnostic in healthcare will be replacing, you know, average doctors or, or robotics with AI or uh, marketing or tax or, or uh, taxation within, within accounting. Or, there is so many stuff going on. How do you envision, since you've been in technology, and, and, and Google CEO contribute this as the largest disruptor in humanity after the invention of fire. Big words coming from tech leaders. How do you envision this affecting the region and MENA region and maybe Iraq specifically? Well, before we go to that, mm -hmm. I, I'll try to, you know, um, you know, in, in order for us to, to look at the future, we need to go back a little bit in the mm. history. You know, um, when you need to move your hand up front, you need to, as you know, as Somehow high, you, you need to bring it back, yeah. then yeah. you move it up front. Uh, if you look at, you know, a couple thousand years, when, when people in closer to the city where I grew mm -hmm. um, invaded the, the, the wheel, mm -hmm. I think it, it's it's a, it's a it's a big revolution when you have a tool that will help you know that wheel, you know, um, you know it's it, it's a, it's amazing you know invention. Mm -hmm. um, when people start writing, capturing the knowledge mm. in a words. When people start, even few hundred years ago, the press. Matba. Mm. Okay, so start, you know, those book written by hand now to be, you know, published in a mass production. Yeah. So the knowledge went right and left, and that's a real, real revolution. Yeah. And then when you go to the industry revolution. Um, so until a time where, I mean, I, I you know, I born after they um, discover the TV or the radio or the airplane. But in my time, I noticed when people start using computer, when the internet came, came in. Yeah. So it was a real revolution. You know, it just imagine what's the impact of this technology called the internet and the computer link to the internet on daily transaction. Mm. If you can look at the percentage of the electronic transaction all around the world compared to the traditional transaction, I mean, you can, you can tell where we are now. Mm. So when we talk about AI, it's going to be another revolution. It's going to be another turning point. However, every one of these revolutions or turning point mm -hmm. human being had, in that time, you can easily see or distinguish between two types of people. One of them exaggerates how this important and game changer. In the other hand, you can see easily uh, people they try to put doubt, even conspiracy theory, uh, how bad this new technology, technology will impact the people. So this is something we have seen it all, mm. uh, all over and over. What's specific now? Couple things. I mean, remember, all these technologies aimed to help humanity humanity i don't think even ai is going to be to destroy humanity unless the human try to use it i mean every tool has a good and a bad use yeah yeah uh, uh, sure uh -huh. but i don't see the what happened in irobot movie or or <laughs> story um but i see something a little bit different again there are area not only in the brain of, of a human being, but as a human being overall, as an entity, always there are unknown in it. Mm. Okay? So we'll see human will be up to the challenge or 
to operate that new revolution, mm -hmm. hopefully to the human benefits. So I'm a big believer on human. Um, doesn't mean we need to just, you know, uh, take a rest and lay down and, and, and think business as usual. No, it's not going to be business as usual. It's going to be a, a real challenge for us to keep up, just like it's a challenge for somebody um, doesn't know how to read and write to read, or somebody doesn't uh, know how to use the computer or, 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 or the internet to learn it. Yeah. It's a challenge in the beginning, and then it become it's uneasy. Kind of easy. Now, the most important thing, and that's what you know, we need to take advantage of. Yeah. Um, there, there are a lot of needs for human. Some of it, it's gonna stay as long as a human alive, regardless of the shape of the civilization we live mm -hmm. in it, regardless of the constraint that we face. I'm hoping the corporations, governments, you know, different type of world organization get together to invest in AI to direct it in a positive way. Uh, last month, there was a lot of talk about uh, tech leaders in the U.S. coming together to kind of put a frame to this industry, which aligns with, with, the, with what you just said. I want to mention something about when you said humans are humans, we still use something that we all use. As uh, one of the wonders of the world is uh, hanging gardens of Babylon. And a lot of people say well, it was built of clay. How did he build gardens on top? And a lot of people don't understand that oil used to be oozing out of the ground. And what he did, he took the, the asphalt and he painted the the elevation and this is why when they put the irrigation system water did not go through the walls that technology is still used today in homes in iraq and even in saudi and the gulf mm -hmm. to to basically prevent if it rains so the the water doesn't go through so sure. stuff like this will be used uh, but uh, without ai we wouldn't have the mrna uh, f for the vaccine for corona ai accelerated the process so this will change certain interest in, in, in aspects of life and and i think the people who will not join the race will be illiterate basically in, in the new world but we'll go move to the next point which is uh, i don't know if i'm pronouncing it correct tahil tahil ta ta mm -hmm. so the tahil project uh, for job creation and vocational training aimed at facilitating uh, uh, weapons reduction in Iraqi society stands out uh, as an important initiative. Can you can you share w w with us more about the project? Again, that was one of the projects that ERU mm -hmm. work on it. You know, I remember in early two th uh, 2016, again, we were in the peak of the war. Mm. Um, we started liberating a couple cities, but we still have a long way to go to finish, you know, liberating all the uh, cities and villages uh, that uh, ISIS took from 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 Iraq. Um, one of the things that, as I mentioned, we 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 envision, it's going to be a problem. I remember I you know met with um, um, representative from donors and and, and um, international um, uh, communities uh, organizations, include you know uh, EU, uh, US AIDS, you know Japan, and a couple other uh, donors from the uh, G7. In that time, uh, we were, uh, you know, um, we ha they they focus mainly on the so 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 called liberated area. You know, when we liberate area, there's an urgent need. Mm for um, you know humanity and also there's a couple other projects to bring refugees back to their home and so in parallel of that I uh, started that proj project I led this project called Ta'heel 
I make it more comprehensive. I, I was, you know, debating with the people uh, from the um, international community. I told them, definitely we all need to focus on liberated area, but don't limit it to liberated area. You know what is the big danger will happen after we liberate this area? The other, the rest of the area where the people who came to liberate this area. So I use the, the, the term المناطق المحررة versus المناطق المحررة. So those fighters who came from villages in Basra or Samawa or Imara or, or Diwania or Hilla or whatever, Kut, Najaf, Karbala, and, 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 and Diala, you know, other, other area, those people, they, especially in the south where they have, you know, the resources, the oil, and they are busy right now fighting. What will happen tomorrow when the fight will be down? They're going to come back with a lot of martyrs, a lot of injured people, disabled people, and they're going to see this um, you know, lack of providing service, the mm. weaknesses of the, the state providing their necessities. And Iraq is not a, a poor country. So I, in that time, I envision something will happen if the government cannot keep up with the challenge. The first thing they're going to do, they're going to uprise. Uh. They, they're going to protest. And we will need to face then or, you know, um, our own people who, who by chance, you know, they all have, you know, uh, arms. You know, mm. the Iraqi society by, by you know, by, by, by na nature, nature, they have a lot of, you know, weapons in, in their villages and their uh, tribes. And um, so the, you know, the, the, the um, society full of weapon mm. came out of a war, internal, external wars uh, with, uh, you know, unhealed wounded. The the project in the beginning, they said, okay, we're going to give them money. They're going to give us the, the weapon. Uh. They're done. We're going to do like a Columbia projects or DDR here or whatever. Uh. Some some other projects. I, I do remember that actually. Yeah. So 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 one of the thing, I said, no, let's go to the, you know, two steps back. Our problem, not only with the weapon itself. It's a problem. It's a big problem. But our problem go two steps back. We have a weak state. We have a weak institution. We have a corruption. We have a failure of delivering the necessities for the people. Mm. And then you just take the weapon. You take it from this hand. They're going to bring another weapon in the other mm. hand. So, and then we're debating, okay, what's, what's the real solution? We... You know, visiting Germany and Japan and couple, you know, many other countries, meeting with their people and meeting with the, you know, uh, experts from all around the world. Or, or, you know, uh, I focus on the, uh, you know, vocational training to create sustainable jobs out of the government, you know, out of the job government, mm. a real job, like initiating the SMEs, you know, small, medium enterprise moving toward um, vibrating the economy rather than just like uh, rely on the government paycheck. And so this program, it's an ambitious program. And the good news, you know, we get a lot of support from the world. Was that the same program you went to Japan for? Yes, it yes, was. exactly. Yeah. You know, um, can you talk about that uh, experience? Sure. You know, the program we planned for this program more than two years. It's brought like a, a lot of uh, entities from the Iraqi government, private sector, NGOs, internally and externally. And Japan took initiative to work with us on this program. And um, so th 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 the goal of this program to create hundred thousands jobs for 12 years, starting from uh, fall 2018 until 2030. Um, we went to Japan and we signed the, um, you know, the um, documents and um, memorandum of understanding. Uh, yeah, with the with the Japan government, and uh, 
uh, 45 countries attended this, include the G20, include, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, you know, partners in the alliance uh, against uh, Daesh. You know, those uh, countries and uh, the organizations include the World Bank, IMF, EU, um, uh, UN uh, Development Fund, Development Program, um, uh, UNDP, and others. You know, sign you know this paper, and uh, again, it's a, it's a fully supported by by the uh, by these countries, and uh, Japan took the initiative on that. Um, we were in Japan, and and the Prime Minister Abadi and Prime Minister Abi that time. Um, you know, sign, and we were uh, attended that that um, uh, um, conference. Um, in the night of that conference, you know, we met with uh, Dr. Ibadi met with with uh, um, uh, CEOs and representative of many companies. You know, mm. uh, from Japan, include you know, a very um, large uh, corporation, and some of them they interested in opening sites in Iraq, assembly lines, include Toyota at that time. It's a, it's, it's a, you know, the hope was very high. And uh, again, it's, it was a, a, a promising project. And now, um, w when you talk about a project like this, the planning and everything goes into it, uh, this was in the last two years of you being in the office, right? Yes. Uh, the continuity of project is very important too. Uh, so hopefully this project will, you know, see see more progress in the ground. Now moving to my next point, uh, I'll start with a quote: uh, "May our cities be like gardens, flourishing with beauty, culture, and harmony." Queen Samiramis. So my question is: You've also been involved in writing the Iraq Vision 2030 uh, and development strategy. What were the key objectives of this vision, and how do you envision its impact in Iraqi future? Uh, I, I want to try to talk about economies of scale here. Uh, as you see, there's other countries in the region that has this same similar vision. Um, we see, for example, in Saudi, Saudi Vision 2030 is led by His, His Highness uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, Wali al -Ahd big impact on the ground uh, and you see the whole region probably will 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 will, will go to uh, different dimensions you see effects in iraq too so can you talk about why it is important to look at iraq as an enabler in the region for economies of scale that could connect the region as a whole because iraq falls in the middle well that's a good question um again I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with, you know, what, what was our vision? You know, the mm -hmm. Iraqi vision for 2030, uh, 2030 it's, uh, it has similarity with the other vision you mentioned in the region, but also it has the uniqueness. Um, you know, it's designed for, for Iraq. Um, mm -hmm. Understanding the realities in Iraq and, and shortcomings and, and the difficulties, challenges, um, if I can, if I can say the 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 um, the base for that vision is to shift the paradigm of the definition of state roles. You know, Iraqi states again, although as a shape changed after two thousand three, different than the state that started you know a century ago and specifically last 35 years before 2003 mm. where the Ba'ath Party came and, and social system, you know, abused the, the economy, abused the education, abused, you know, all the um, society. Unfortunately, you know, those 20 years, it was full of uh, everything other than the building, the state uh, foundation. So the paradigm that we were try to focus on it, it's shifting the, the purpose of a state from uh, controlling the citizens to a state servant to the citizen. Uh, 
the economy from economy heavily depend on one uh, commodity fluctuated in the price and you are under the mercy of the market yep. mercy of uncontrollable factors to a commodity uh, to a diversify economy you know in iraq we don't need to talk about you know the opportunities in iraq again agriculture industry and tourism you know iraq is a site for almost many relig- religious you know you know mm-hmm. in iraq um if if uh, you know if we put the train on the track we get that direction i think um, we don't have shortage in the resources human resources you know natural resources the location of iraq you know geopolitics could help iraq rather than become iraq the you know mm. the, the core of the uh, unstability yeah. um by end of it the 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 uh, vision itself aim to transform iraq Iraqi society to a healthy society uh, in a different you know using different uh, approaches and paths you know in education and, and health and economy you know even using our energy um, and you know in a sustainable way um, for your question you know how could we connect with the other area how mm. could we bring the area together that's that's my belief you know again i always believe um having a, a unique country in a region in a bad region in an unstable region it's not a sustainable model mm-hmm. you got to st- spend a lot of a lot of on the security if if mm-hmm. if you have a very nice uh, palace surrounding in a in a very b- poor neighbors yeah or or unstable neighbors okay but if you have all the neighbor working together mm-hmm. good um then you can you can and again you know learning from my experience in semiconductor dealing mm-hmm. with the uh, for example the south asian uh, sometime you know you if you if you pick your phone you, you very difficult for you to see who manufacture or who who get you know participate to bring you that piece you can you can see six seven sometimes 10 or or even 15 countries factories in different countries in the same area mm. okay um so so uh, rise one country um, uh, alone it's not um, sustainable but you know having a iraqi vision connected with the other area again not only from opportunity uh, itself but also from threats yeah i'm talking i'm not only talking about um, uh, radical people like daesh or other group that threat entire the region but also i'm talking about for example the food cli- cli- no, cli- climate change climate change food security, uh, you know yeah. food security you know mm-hmm. many other things that if we share it wisely we can grow mm-hmm. together if we disconnect we're gonna pay you know heavily prices mm. and the good news again you know the the bad news the reason you know spend a lot of from their resources for last a few decades you know fighting each other or mm. you know trying to put each other down mm. now i think it's the time although it's late but never late it's it's time to work together to um you know embrace and 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 support each other um to get to a stable um uh, fruitful productive uh, societies well some some people look at iraq as the east gate to 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 iran and others look at it as a bridge or being transformed to a bridge which is i think i believe the case uh moving f- forward economically and security in the, in the region can you comment on what is the role of iraq in facilitating this and why iraq is have an important role to play in the future you remind me on um, um a group team that initiated in, in uh, um, uh, american university in cairo a couple of years ago we put try to put a report to envision the future of the arab region for the next decade um 
I've heard from a couple, you know, um, uh, individuals talking about the traditional approach, the Iraq al Bawab al Sharqiyya lil Umm al Arabiyya, meaning the Iraq is is the eastern gate for the uh, for the Arab nation. Mm. I presented, you know, a different approach, and I said, okay, enough for being, you know, gate. And we suffer eight years from the war uh, against Iran. We had a lot of problem, you know, with, with Turkey, you know, and same thing, you know, uh, probably other area. But um, our new approach for new Iraq is bridge, not gate. Mm. So uh, being a bridge, meaning you cannot put a bridge in any stable area. Mm. When I stay... You know, not only from geological, uh, you know, perspective, you need to have a stable, you know, land to put the bridge. And also you need to have a secure area to have the bridge. Um, by end of it, willing or unwilling, you know, the uh, East Asia and West Africa, they're going to cooperate and also they're going to cooperate with the rest of Asia. Mm. Same thing, you know, the Gulf area, they're going to connect it with Europe, or connect with you know, all these, you know, goes through Iraq. So Iraq could play a positive role rather than the traditional role that the previous regime uh, tried to do it, you know, fighting, you know, ref, you know left and f f right and, and, mm. and south and north. We can play that role. But the most important thing, I cannot see um, Iraq going back to its, you know, real potential role unless we, um, you know, we um, accomplish our internal um, harmony, harmony and, and reconciliation and, and building, you, you know. You can be mediator for others, mm -hmm. but if you don't have a stable house, I mean, it's worthless. True. Yeah. Now, every one of us has an internal conflict when it comes to cross borders, cross culture, cross language, cross experiences, and you have many. <laughs> you lived in different countries, you've traveled a lot, you had a lot of uh, conflicts along the way and challenges. Uh, when you go to Iraq, you are the, the guy who, you know, spent a lot of time in the U.S. and educated in the U.S. And sometimes you have a difficult time to connect and convince people to do certain things. And when you come here, you are the Iraqi who is in the U.S. Uh, and you have your own challenges within, within you. Can you talk about that? Well, again, you know, moving from city to city, from state to state, from... Um, you know, different part of the world to the others has its own, you know, pros and cons. I mean, from one hand, um, again, I'm, I'm grateful and thankful that I had the opportunities to, you know, study and learn, um, you know, in, in, in different countries and also had the pleasure and, uh, and, and uh, great opportunity to meet with different people from different um, ethnicity background from different religions from different um, you know you know diverse work and learn from them mm -hmm. uh, exchange experience um, um, uh, and, and, and explore the the human experience experience however uh, there are a lot of challenges you know again let's let's be honest um, you know the the um, U.S. image in that part of the world is not reflecting always the realities. Mm -hmm. Sometimes exaggerating positively and sometimes exaggerating negatively. So when you go there, some I mean that's what happened in, in Iraq after two thousand three. Mm -hmm. People think you know this is the giant in the world. This is you know they can have a, that magic button they can push it and then they can turn the electricity <laughs> they can solve the problem they can mm -hmm. uh, and this is not true okay um but again on the other hand you know um, people look at it as a you know great satan or or it's, it's a big devil or uh, 
by end of it, you know, ideologies, conflicts, and um, and interest conflicts, it's always there, all around the world. The good, how could we manage uh, through these differences and create models that um, bring benefits for both parties, for both nations, for both communities? And I'm always, always, I can find similarities and I can find an area that bring win-win uh, mm. for both uh, sides. But it's challenges. And so, uh, so you, you worked, uh, you're a fellow at the Middle East Institute, correct? Yes, Visi so, visiting fellow. Visiting fellow. And, and uh, could you talk about some of the writings and, and, and what's your uh, message you want to aim to convey to the audience? Well, again, I, since I left the um, the government jobs, I took time off, and then Corona came, and so I, I had a couple uh, research projects. Um, so I try to um, bring the you know the the elevate the awareness in both parts, you know, in Washington area and in Iraq and the region. Um, addressing couple issues, and again, um, people see me raising the flag many times, you know, anticipating uh, problems could happen, and then unfortunately, it happened the way how I anticipated or I envision it, which is very sad. I mean, when you see something, you envision it, and there is no action, and then it happened. Same. Be careful, don't be in the trap, and then, whoops, you are in the trap. Okay. And then you repeat it second day and third day. That's mm. a, that's unpleasant. But in my articles, I had a project, um, and that project to focus on the institutional reform in Iraq. Um, again, the, 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 the image, it's not um, totally pessimistic, although it has a lot of challenges. Mm. Um, so a lot of people talk about, you know, um, constitutional reform or uh, revolutionary or changing, you know, shifting the game. Um, I can see the needs for a, 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 a deep change, but I can see also uh, areas that, um, um, that Iraqis could work on it today easily than tomorrow so if they delay it so i focus for example on the because again my my area of focus it's how could we get a healthy economy diverse mm. economy how we create the jobs for iraqis but i cannot see any reform in education in economy in health and in, in society without political change political reform on the other hand, I cannot see political reform without reforming the party system. So, so mm. one of the um, uh, papers devoted on that. Um, I have a couple other papers, you know, about administrative uh, reform. Um, and again, it's it's went deeply to the level it might become um, separately a book by itself. Mm. You know, not. Uh, a small paper. Um, and in addition to that, we participated in a couple of events and forum. Is there any, uh, I, I know you've interacted with many think tanks and, 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 and so forth. Uh, is there any connection between think tanks here in the US and any think tank in Iraq? Well, um, the concept of think tank is not uh, new in Iraq, although for the last 10 years, there is a growing number of think tank in, in Baghdad. In Baghdad, okay. yes, and it, it wasn't an active the way how they are right now. Recently, you can probably, if you watch the news over there, always there is a forum and there is a leaders coming. You know, the mm -hmm. typical you know, uh, the um, government include the prime minister himself. You mm -hmm. know, the ministers, the uh, you know people from academia. And now a lot of you know uh, scholars and, 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 and 
and fellow researchers from U.S., from Europe, from the region, you know, especially Come from the know. Gulf, from Iran, from Turkey, from, uh, you know, Egypt, uh, come to Baghdad and vice versa, you know. I participated in many events in, in, in the region. So I can see more, more, which is very positive. You know, again, remember, you know, all these activities, it bring an, bring an environment, create an environment that foster and and help and 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 and, and, and enable not only the uh, scholars themselves or researcher but also sometime enable the uh, officials and former officials to speak and think out of their small little boxes mm. so it create a lot of solution uh, but again it's a uh, you know, as as always, you know, talk. So work, work in a progress. Work in a progress and always dialogue better than fighting. Fine. Uh, I have a couple more questions to cover, so I'm going to move fast in the couple questions. One very important, crucial point uh, uh, that I want to talk about or cover is the rivers of, this is a quote, last quote, I promise. Sure, sure, sure. No, no. <laughs> uh, the, the beginning of the quote is, the rivers of Mesopotamia bless us with abundance, and it is our duty to protect and preserve them. This is almost 2,500 years old quote by Telgath Pelsar III. Prime Minister recently commented on Iraq needs an international help for the decni- declining levels in Dijla and Furat. Yes. Can you comment on that and what, what do you envision a solution is? Uh, to, to me, a conversation with Turkey could solve the issue. But maybe you can expand on that. I know it's, it sounds simple, but, but you probably know better. Well, again, I'm not a specialist in the, you know, in the um, irrigation system or in the water by itself. But um, you know, um, I study a lot. You know, the, remember the role of the Al Furat and Dijla in Iraq. It's a, you know, it's equal equal Iraq. When you say Iraq, meaning you know, uh, the 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 country between those two rivers. Okay, Bilad Ma Bain Al Nahrain, or or they call it Bilad Al Rafidain, the the you know two rivers. Two rivers. C- country mm. so it's it's essential part of our culture our mindset our life um unfortunately you know the the with all this environmental you know climate change and also with um, um uh, a low level of um, water management mm. and agriculture norms and and, and practices in many areas, they still use the the way of irrigation that we used it five or six thousand years ago, which is again, it's um, it's not uh, efficient, uh, obviously. However, <coughs> in addition to the reforms that need to be done inside Iraq, but also, you know, having too many dams in Turkey, in Turkey specifically, and even in Iran, but mainly in Turkey and probably in Syria, probably one dam, but mainly in Turkey, mm-hmm. it, it should be a um, um, uh, big flag that Iraqi officials um, need to address it. And that's what happened during our you know, administration. And I think th- there are a lot of attempts in the next you know, previous uh, you know, administrations, the, those who mm-hmm. came after us, and even the administration before us, but but I don't see um, the level of opening the Banadora box. Just open it. Don't uh, you know my approach? If you have a problem like this, you don't leave it. Just go open it, and open it in a in a healthy way. Um, I read a report this morning early. You know, I'm talking about twenty plus probably. I'm not quite sure of the number billion dollars ex- you know exchange between Iraq and Turkey and same thing with Iran and we have a lot of you know um, uh, exchange trade exchange with Syria as well but if we talk about Turkey um, I was planning you know and uh, and I think uh, others also 
I thought about you know having a project inside Iraq, include you know in the south, specifically in the south, where we have a lot of wa water shortage. Um, <clears throat> although we start now having the shortage all around Iraq, um, you know that concept of bringing together investors know, from Turkey, investor to from Turkey, from Gulf, from Iran, from you mm. know from the region, but specifically those who has um, you know, uh, interest to keep the water flowing. Mm, in that's very, very interesting. Yes, uh, you know, I proposed that almost a decade ago, uh, and I said, unless they have interest with interest in it, then we can probably it's talk like an about incentive. Yeah. Right now, it's it's a kind of love from one side. Yeah. It's not going to work. I, I mean, when you look at the trade balance, Tur Turkey is the single largest trade partner with with Iraq, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, right? Yeah, again, they, they if, if they are they are largest, but even if they are not larger, the largest, but they have a big portion. Again, I'm talking about, you know, mm -hmm. uh, double digits, billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> so Iraq has a lot of cards could play it if the decision maker try to. Uh, we have a couple of questions, but let's move fast because I have one more question to ask before we close. Uh, looking ahead, what are your aspirations for the future, both personally and professionally? Uh, are there any specific goals or projects you're excited to pursue? Well, um, I'm, I'm a busy man, always, you know, if not writing, reading, and also interacting with people, but also, you know, being in and uh, creating my, you know, founding the the... the ECG, Euphrates uh, Consultant Group, um, had a couple of projects now working with the, you know, uh, different uh, partners and uh, digital transformation, technology transfer, and also um, um, the key concept in my mind is how could we create better life for typical Iraqis and others, you know, the young, the young people, how could we help them to find their themselves in the, in the, in this, uh, you know, um, um, uh, a crazy world where, you know, things moving too fast and also where the, the, the um, technology you cannot keep up with. So how could we teach them um, new skills that will enable them um, uh, to go through a, a challenging world. Um, also, in a personal level, I have a couple, two books, uncompleted books, require, you know, uh, editing, then try to, you know, to publish them. Uh, so in a business level, I'm too busy in a academic and, and, and research level also. And always, as always, enjoying, you know, uh, having a large family and, uh, you know, playing good time with my grandkids, with my kids, and, and, and uh, splitting my time between, you know, uh, U.S. and Iraq and the region and... and, and always look uh, to the future in an optimistic, uh, optimistic way. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, before the identity capital question, I'll, I, I know, I, I know I thought I said, uh, I thought I said that was the last quote, but there no, is another no, quote. No. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, knowledge is the greatest treasure one can possess. Mm -hmm. Seek it relentlessly and share it generously. And the quote, Enki. I can't believe these like 2,000, 3,000 years old sure. quotes. Uh, so the identity capital question is, if time goes back, uh, with all the knowledge you have today, uh, what would you tell your younger self or tell the young generation lessons you learned through experience not read from books? The life is too short. We shouldn't waste it. Uh, in a conflict about illusions. I feel 
I need to reprioritize the goals, I go back like 40 years or 50 years with this knowledge and experience and, you know, visiting um, tons of countries and states and meeting with leadership all around the world, politicians and religious leaders, you know, business leaders. If I go back, uh, I'm going to put the first thing in my priorities is the self-reconciliation. Mm. Um, I'm going to relook at the history, which is usually the history, one of the motivation for wars and for conflict and for, um, you know, um, a lot of disaster that we faced. Um, we don't need to have the history as a burden. Mm. Um, I would, I would look at the history as a, as a, um, a source of motivation to learn from their mistakes, to continue their, you know, achievements. I would also look at the wealth in a different way. Uh, usually, you know, that's what, what I learned from my dad and my parent, you know, my mom and my family, you know, the, the wealth. It's going to be curse without um, um, uh, uh, mature management. Mm. Um, if I will go back, I will even invest more in my family, in my friends, Ariel friends, and the other friends, which is the books. Mm. Um, and also, I will invest more in the land I love. You know. I'm, I didn't mention the gardening, you know, it's mm, one like of my, my, yeah, my, mm. my hobbies and, and who knows, I might be, I may become farmers in, in, in one of the villages closer to Samoa mm. or in the desert oasis. This is awesome. Uh, I think all the messages you just mentioned revolve around one thing, improving communication whether it's communication by conflict, when you talked about conflict, communicating with, with, with your peers or communicating within the family or communicating with yourself. And I think gardening will make a great time sitting by yourself, communicating your thoughts. Sure. Uh, Dr. Nafal Al-Hassan, this was a great. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And I wish you and your program uh, the best. And inshallah, I'll see you soon. See you soon. And uh, this was Identity Capital. Thank you for tuning in.